Welcome! In today's video, we are going to explore the Paris Peace Treaties after the First World War, how they shaped Europe, and more importantly, how they might have been different in realistic and not so realistic ways. Exploring the goals of the Entente nations in the process. Let's dive in. To start off with, what were the strategies of the big three Entente members when going into the peace negotiations? The French one is the easiest to define. They wanted to punish Germany hard. France had suffered most out of the Western Entente nations as the bulk of the fighting took place on their soil. Not to mention that this wasn't the first invasion by the Germans, as Prussia had crushed France in 1870 as well, taking Alsace-Lorraine from the French and unifying Germany as a result of the war. This invasion had taken place only 44 years before the outbreak of World War II, and French President Georges Clemenceau had lived through both of these invasions. Clemenceau went to the peace conference with the simple goal of not allowing this to happen again. The French goals were therefore quite simple. Remove the threat from Germany in any way possible. This could be done by weakening Germany, but also by securing security guarantees from the United States and Britain in the case of another invasion. French plans also called for the creation of a new security framework in Eastern Europe, with France working closely together with many Eastern European states to prevent a new rise of Germany or the spread of communism. Elsewhere, French plans were driven by imperialism, seeking to expand French control into former German colonies and Ottoman territories. In contrast to France, who was driven by revanchism and imperialism, the United States was driven by idealism. The US was the last to enter the war, but their president, Wilson, considered it his duty to push for his ideals to be implemented. These ideals were specified in his 14 points, but an oversimplification is that the US hoped to push for self-determination for at least the European populations, while building a framework of international relations that would prevent new wars and allow liberalism and democracy to flourish. The Americans also held a much softer stance on Germany, as they considered that decimating Germany would be counterproductive to long-term relations. These two peace strategies were, in my opinion, perfectly described by the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George, who remarked about the negotiations that he did not do badly, considering I was seated between Jesus Christ and Napoleon. Referring to Wilson's idealism as akin to Jesus Christ, and Clemenceau's revanchism as akin to Napoleon. This quote also encapsulates the British stance on the negotiation, as Britain was the moderate between these two extremes. Britain did have a couple of goals that they needed to have met. France would need to be safe from further invasion, the threat from the German navy needed to be neutralized, and, if possible, the British Empire would need to be strengthened. But none of these goals called for any extreme measures against the Germans. In fact, Britain was open to an economically strong Germany following the war, since that would be much, much better for British business. These were the broad goals of the big three Entente powers at the Paris Peace Treaties. There were, obviously, the concerns of the other Entente members to keep in mind, but these were more localized to their own interests, and they didn't hold the same sway that these three superpowers held. With these three in the driver's seat, five main peace deals were negotiated as compromises between the various Entente powers. The most well-known is obviously Versailles. This treaty concerned itself with the future of Germany, and while it was often considered as harsh, it was arguably one of the less severe treaties, but we'll get to that. The main points of the treaty were as follows. Germany and the larger central powers were to accept full responsibility for starting the conflict. Germany would have to pay heavy war reparations to the Entente, importantly to France and Belgium, as compensation for the damages done during the war, and to ensure that Germany couldn't be a threat to France again, their army was restricted to only 100,000 men, with no air force or tanks allowed, and only a limited navy. In terms of territorial demands, Germany had to give up their entire colonial empire, cede Eupen Malmedy to Belgium, Alsace-Lorraine to France, the Polish Corridor to Poland, and interestingly, Schleswig to Denmark, despite Denmark not even participating in the war. Furthermore, the Saarland was temporarily taken away from Germany to later get a referendum over whether to join France or Germany, while the rest of the Rhineland would be demilitarized and temporarily occupied by the French and Belgians. Then we have the treaty that dealt with what was at the time known as German Austria, known as the Treaty of saint germain en laye as both Austria and Hungary would receive separate treaties despite their Austro-Hungarian unity. This also called for war reparations, although 
These were never collected as the Austrian economy had severely declined following the war. The Austrian army would also be restricted to 30,000 men. In terms of territorial losses, Austria would be decimated. They would have to cede Tyrol and Istria to Italy, including this German majority region of Tyrol, Dalmatia, Bosnia and Slovenia were to be ceded to Yugoslavia, while in the east, Bukovina would be ceded to Romania and Galicia and Lodomeria to Poland. The Czech lands would be reformed into a new Czechoslovak state, again including the German dominated lands. Finally, and perhaps most uniquely, Austria actually gained some lands in the peace deal, as this strip of land, known as Burgenland, was ceded by Hungary to Austria. Most interestingly though, the Austrian treaty included a provision that Austria couldn't compromise its independence. This may sound like a relatively vague and strange statement, but it was very deliberately meant to prevent Austria from rejoining Germany in the future, as joining another nation surely compromises their independence. In the same vein, German Austria was no longer allowed as the name of the new nation, and henceforth it would be known as just Austria. Then we have the least known of the peace treaties, and for good reason. The Treaty of Nili sur Seine. This peace treaty dealt with Bulgaria, and it was by far the mildest of the treaties. Which makes sense, as none of the big three had any significant interest in Bulgaria. It included the standard restriction on the army, as well as war reparations, but the territorial concessions were pretty mild. Bulgaria had already been defeated recently by Greece, Serbia and Romania in the Second Balkan War, and there were few reasonable demands left. Greece got Western Thrace, Yugoslavia gained some borderlands, and Romania gained Dobrugia. Then we have the Treaty of Trianon, which dealt with Hungary. This peace deal would be greatly impacted by new developments on the ground, as while the treaty was being negotiated, Hungary had had a communist revolution and denounced the Paris peace negotiations. This was obviously a no-go for the Allies, since not only had the Allies been promised Hungarian lands, but also nobody liked communism. Out of fear of communism, France sided with Yugoslavia, Romania and Czechoslovakia and supported heavy penalties on the defeated nation. The resulting peace deal would see Slovakia included into the newly created Czechoslovakia, obviously, Transylvania being ceded to Romania and Yugoslavia would gain Croatia and Vojvodina. As mentioned before, Burgenland would also be lost to Austria and finally, Carpathian Ruthenia would be ceded to Czechoslovakia as well. This treaty pained Hungary greatly for two reasons. Many of these lands had been, arguably, under Hungarian control since 900. That's a millennia of Hungarian control over these lands. But, more importantly, many of these territories still held significant Hungarian populations, now divorced from their home nation. Obviously, Hungary would also get army restrictions and war reparations put on them. Then finally, we have the Treaty of Sèvres, which would deal with the Ottoman Empire and be, in my opinion, the harshest peace deal out of the five by far. The Ottoman Empire would lose control over their Arab lands, which would be turned into British and French mandates, officially for them to prepare the lands for independence. This was already a heavy blow to the Ottomans, but this was more than understandable. But further territorial demands were to be made. Armenia would be expanded into eastern Anatolia, Greece would gain Eastern Thrace permanently, as well as a protectorate over parts of Asia Minor, which would get a plebiscite in five years to choose between joining Greece or the Ottomans permanently. Italy would gain the Dodecanese Islands, while Turkish Kurdistan would get a referendum in five years on whether or not Kurdistan would get their independence. These territorial demands were already harsh, but they were not all. Britain would get a small sphere of influence over parts of Turkish Kurdistan, France over the rest of Kurdistan, as well as a part of southern Turkey. Italy would gain a sphere of influence over southwestern Anatolia, and finally, the Bosphorus would be turned into an international zone of influence. All of these demands were very significant, but we're not done, as the following restrictions were quite intentionally meant to turn the Ottomans into little more than a puppet state of the Entente. Their army was restricted to 70,000 men, and their navy severely restricted in size as well. The Ottomans would be put into heavy debt to the Entente and no economic decisions could be made without oversight from Italy, France and Britain. The Ottoman budget, financial institutions, the Ottoman national banks and the Ottoman debt would all be controlled by the former Entente. They were also forced to grant freedom of movement of people, goods and vessels to the Entente 
essentially removing terrorists from the nation and destroying the Ottoman economic independence. The difference between the Treaty on the Ottomans and the treaties on the other central powers were clear. The others were European nations defeated in the war, the Ottomans were a place that could be turned into a de facto colony. This treaty, however, would not see implementation, as Mustafa Kemal Atatürk would defeat the Entente in the Turkish War for Independence, with the former Entente deciding that it was not worth the trouble to enforce the treaty on Turkey. So, these were the treaties in our own timeline. Let's now theorize some alternate treaties if we assume that different states had gotten their way. I will focus on territorial changes and not on army restrictions, war reparations or international recognition. With that, let's start with the Treaty of nili sur seine dealing with Bulgaria. This is the most difficult one to think of the alternate version of, since the big three Entente members didn't really care too much and the neighboring small Entente nations didn't have too many claims on the nation either. Romania taking Dobruja, Serbia taking some minor border territories and Greece taking Western Thrace is about the worst peace deal the Bulgarians were realistically going to get. The Bulgarians didn't really have more minorities to split from the nation and in a worst case scenario Greece may push for annexing some more lands, especially if Greece gains Eastern Thrace from the Ottomans as well, but all of this is quite unlikely. One extreme case scenario we could theorize, however, is the inclusion of Bulgaria into the newly founded Yugoslavia. Bulgarians are a southern Slavic people, much like the rest of Yugoslavia, but this too is a difficult proposal, as the inclusion of Croatia and Slovenia could be painted as Serbian liberation and there were no prior kings or nations in the region, as it was the Austrians and Hungarians who held the land, while in contrast, Bulgaria had been an independent kingdom for far longer and it was likely that the Bulgarians wouldn't be happy to adapt to their inclusion. Not to mention that it's very well possible that the new Serbian-led Yugoslavia wouldn't even want Bulgaria to join, as it would threaten the relative position of strength that Serbia held within the new state. So, my worst case scenario for Bulgaria or Greece taking some more lands or Yugoslavia annexing the nation altogether. Next up we have Austria. For Austria there are a couple of alterations to the treaty of Saint-Germain-en-Laye we can make. Italy had entered the war being promised Tyrol, some parts of Dalmatia and control over Istria from the Habsburg Empire. In our timeline Italy gained most of Istria and Tyrol but not Dalmatia, which went to Yugoslavia instead. An easy change we can make is to give Italy Dalmatia as promised. Over in the east of the empire, ceding Bukovina to Romania is about the only thing that makes sense, but the territory of eastern Galicia is interesting. In our timeline, Poland gained both western Galicia as well as eastern Galicia, but this didn't have to happen. While western Galicia was inhabited primarily by Poles, Eastern Galicia was actually primarily inhabited by Ukrainians, with the only notable exception of the area's biggest city, Lvov, which was primarily inhabited by Poles. We could say that an alternate treaty makes Ukraine independent in Eastern Galicia, with plans to expand the nation eastwards into lands controlled by Soviet Russia. This plan would be unpopular with Poland, but if the Entente powers would really push for it, it could be possible. Perhaps if Ukrainian independence fighters have some more success during the Russian Civil War. The ceding of Bosnia to Serbia is also something that I don't see changing, as southern Slavic unity was supported by Wilsonian self-determination, as well as British and French desires to reward their Serbian ally. But perhaps the most interesting change that we can make is to extend Wilson's points of self-determination to Austria itself. In the eventual peace deal, all minorities of the empire apart from Ukraine, got self-rule at the expense of Austria and Hungary, understandably. But the Austrians themselves didn't, as German majority territories were stripped away from Austria to Czechoslovakia and Italy. If we allow the people in those territories to choose which nation they want to join, it's very well possible that they choose to remain with Austria, resulting in this absolutely awful looking Austria. But we can extend Austria's right to self-determination even further and allow Austria to join Germany, which is something that many Austrians did desire during the 20s. We will get back to this idea when discussing the Treaty of Versailles soon. If we are following Wilson's self-determination in regards to Italy's claims as well, the border between Yugoslavia and Italy could end up looking something like this. 
If we follow Wilson's self-determination as much as possible, this is the division of the formerly Austrian Empire I would come up with. We then move on to Hungary, where we have several options to tinker with the peace deal of our own timeline, which would see all these territories stripped away from Hungary. The most obvious one is to follow Wilson's line of thinking and allow for more regions to have plebiscites about whether to join Hungary or any of the new states. This would result in a slight expansion of Hungary to the south, while also giving Hungary significant parts of what is today southern Slovakia. If we assume a Ukrainian state was created in the peace deal with Austria, we could also give Carpatho Ruthenia and some minor parts of Slovakia to this new Ukrainian state instead. The biggest issue would, however, arise over Transylvania. While there are a couple of border adjustments we can make, pushing Hungary further east, this area, however, was mostly inhabited by Hungarians, but lies deep within Romanian-dominated surroundings. For completion's sake, there are also pockets of Germans living in the region, but we will ignore them as they are too small. The problem with this new territory should be obvious. Via the logic of self-determination, something like this should be the new Romanian-Hungarian border, but this is something that could never happen as it just isn't practical. Instead, this area might get some autonomy within Romania, or a population transfer might remove the Hungarians from the region. In contrast, a harsher peace deal is pretty difficult to imagine, as all their neighbors got their legitimate claims and more respected. Something close to this would be my alternate way of dividing up the Austro-Hungarian Empire post-World War I, if we primarily base ourselves on Wilson's idea of self-determination. And just by looking at how terrible these new borders look, maybe there is a reason the Entente didn't do this. If we unrealistically assume that nothing else changes, this is how the borders would look in 1936, and this is how these borders would look if they survived all the way to the modern day. Next up, we have the Treaty of Sèvres, one of the most interesting ones to theorize about, as this is the case where British, Italian, Greek and French imperialism most directly clashed with Wilson's idealism. Obviously, we would first have to imagine the treaty actually gets implemented, which, as mentioned, wasn't the case in our own timeline. From here, changes can be easily imagined. To start off with the Arab portion, there was the obvious promise to the Arabians that they would get their own independent state following the war, creating this Arabian superstate instead of seeing the region carved up by imperialist powers. There was also the American plan. This really wasn't a direct plan, but it called for a commission to research the Middle East and recommend a future course of action. In our timeline, the commission decided that the Middle East wasn't ready yet for self-government and should be turned into mandates until they are ready to fully rule themselves. The exception was Syria, which was suggested to become an independent, liberal and secular republic. Obviously, France would never agree to this, but Syria becoming independent after World War I could have become a reality while the rest becomes a mandate of Britain. But there are many, many more changes that we can make to the Anatolian part of the peace deal. Here, I first want to mention the most insane and hilarious proposal I have found during research. Wilson, in the name of self-determination, carved out these borders for Armenia in eastern Anatolia. This didn't happen in real life thanks to the Turkish civil war, but it's very well possible that Armenia could have looked like this in an alternate reality. Even more interestingly though, this Armenian state was supposed to first become a mandate, much like the Middle East. Who was supposed to oversee this mandate? That's right, the US of A, baby. Wilson attempted to secure an American mandate over Armenia, but the US Senate voted against this proposal. This means that there can be a somewhat historical alternate history scenario that, at least temporarily, has an American Armenia, which is just amazing. Then we have Kurdistan, which even in our timeline could have easily achieved independence. As like I said, plebiscites were planned for the region. But don't get too excited and expect a big Kurdish state, as France and Britain weren't about to give up on their own land gains, but Turkish Kurdistan becoming an independent state was a very clear possibility. We then have the zones of influence of our own timeline, but there was a time when the Entente wasn't so tame in their ideas for the region, planning to instead carve out direct territories from Anatolia. The most interested parties for this division were France, Greece and Italy. France could simply extend their Syrian mandate into Anatolia proper, Italy sought control over at least parts of southwestern Anatolia, while Greece, well, 
Greece pretty much wanted the entire Turkish coastline. If Greece fully gets their way, this may have been the new shape of Turkey. Instead, we could extend the self-determination principle that freed Armenia and Kurdistan to the Greco-Turkish border, which would result in this, or more realistically, something like this. I'd say these are the two extremes for Turkey. This, which somewhat follows Wilson's self-determination, or this, which would see the extremes of French, Italian and Greek imperial desires upon the nation, including, of course, American Armenia. Then finally, the peace treaty we've all been waiting for, the Treaty of Versailles. Now, while it is often described as a very harsh peace deal, I personally consider it one of the less harsh of the bunch, with only Bulgaria getting an easier peace deal. But still, just because others got it rougher, doesn't mean that Germany didn't get a harsh peace deal too. But believe me, we can do worse. Let's start off with a bang and discuss extreme French desires for Germany. Obviously, this would include stripping Alsace-Lorraine from Germany and also the direct annexation of the Saarland into France. This Saarland region was rich in industrial resources, mainly coal, and was therefore important for France to equal Germany in industrial development. Then we have the Rhine region, which France would preferably see completely split off from Germany, destroying Germany's western industrial base and removing the most obvious direction for a German attack into France. More radical proposals even included France directly taking the Rhineland, or even, although this is greatly unrealistic, France taking Belgium and Luxembourg as well, drastically changing the balance of power between Germany and France. This should explain why the British Prime Minister referred to the French President as a Napoleon. But that's not all that France was planning or considered to do, as France even floated the idea of reverting Germany back to some form of a mass of divided states as it had been before 1870, as well as Polish expansion into Prussia. If France had gotten their way with Germany, there would likely be no Germany following the war. But, back to some form of realism, a moderate, French-dominated peace deal would certainly include Alsace-Lorraine and the Saarland to France, an independent Rhineland, an expanded Poland and Lithuania, and, surprisingly, Denmark being expanded into Holstein. In our timeline, France and Britain actually attempted to pressure Denmark into annexing both Schleswig and Holstein, but since Holstein was primarily inhabited by Germans, Denmark refused and only took Schleswig. It is very possible that in an alternate timeline, France and Britain could manage to get Denmark to accept this land grant. It's also very likely that Poland expands at least a bit more into eastern Prussia, and especially into the industrially important region of Silesia, further crippling the German industry. Something like this would be my somewhat realistic prediction for a French-led division of Germany. Let's now instead focus on Wilson's idea of self-determination. What could we come up with? We can start with the absolute least likely part of this peace deal. Alsace-Lorraine would not be fully absorbed by France, but instead divided between France and Germany, as Germany keeps the German-speaking parts of the region. In the north, plebiscites would see Schleswig entering Denmark, while in the east, we would see the expansion of Poland, but slightly less extreme than in our own timeline. This would still lead to a very complicated new border if we only focus on nationality, so I would guess that Poland still gets their corridor to the sea, cutting off East Prussia from Germany and creating these truly horrid borders. As an easter egg, we could even say that an independent state is created here in Silesia, as a small national group of the Sorbs get their own state, but I consider it more likely that the Sorbs get autonomy and recognition within Germany rather than a fully independent state. Finally, we turn our eyes to Austria again, inserting the Austro-Hungarian version of a Wilsonite peace deal. Like mentioned before, if Austria truly got their self-determination, they might very well choose to integrate with Germany. This would create a very strange situation where Germany, at the end of World War I, actually grew in size and power. This would obviously make this a completely unrealistic peace deal, but if we follow self-determination to the extreme, Something like this would be my end result for Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Adding the Bulgarian and Ottoman peace deal results in this new map of Europe in 1920 if we follow self-determination wherever possible. It's an absolutely wild map, especially with big Germany, but it's interesting to imagine nonetheless. Carrying over to World War II, these would be the borders in 1936 
obviously, if nothing changes, which is unrealistic, and these would be the borders in modern day Europe, again, unrealistically assuming nothing else changes in Europe. Personally, I love the idea of this peace deal actually going through, just for the ideas that people would read the headlines after the peace deal was signed, and the outrage that would rage across the Entente as headlines would read, Germany loses war, becomes larger than ever. Let's now do the other extreme and draw an alternate map where Polish, French, Italian, Serbian, Greek and British ambitions were all realized. We first have the Ottomans, which get carved up by Greece, Italy, France, Kurdistan, Britain and, of course, American Armenia. Next up we have Bulgaria, which gets absorbed into Yugoslavia. Hungary, which doesn't really change too much in terms of how they get carved up. Austria, which only changes by giving Dalmatia to Italy instead of Yugoslavia. And finally, Germany, which, assuming they don't get fully divided up by France, would look something like this. To conclude, carrying these borders over to 1936 results in this monstrosity of a map, although, I gotta say, Poland does kind of look great. Carrying these borders over to an unchanged modern map, we would end up with this as a final result. This is obviously just a fun thought exercise, and a treaty like this would have required some radical change in history, but this is what I would come up with as a total imperialist revanchist Entente victory. Both of these maps are completely unrealistic to fully happen in any alternate history scenario, but they are still a nice exploration of some of the potentials for changes to the treaties that ended World War I. I hope some of you have learned something, or even found something valuable to use in your own alternate timelines, but most of all, I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. Thank you all for watching, if you enjoyed the content, consider subscribing and leaving a like and a comment to help against the algorithm. A special thanks to Lord Atlantean, Yoshi, Jonathan White, Predator, Greyshot151, Alexander Brown, John, Berzemek, Petrotsky, Firelord Marklin, Dinkelberg and Slayer for supporting me on Patreon. Consider supporting me there for early access to videos and a shout out at the end of every video. Again, thank you all for watching and goodbye.